Well, before we enter into our teaching time, last week we, we introduced uh, th this card to you. As we're looking at a passage that talks about the attitude of Christ and an attitude that calls us outward to seek out the interests, interests of others, we are given opportunities to live it out this month. And so uh, we have provided this card that each week there are some opportunities for you to consider the interests of others. And I, I hope you got an opportunity during week one to do one of the things from this first week. If not, you, you can certainly jump into that. But in week two, uh, we, we're going to encourage you to do a couple things. Serve in a soup kitchen. That There's actually opportunities in, in this area. Churches are doing that. Send a note of kindness to a neighbor. That's a great way for us to build relationships with each other. And then find a way to serve a family member. Sometimes that's the last people that we end up finding ourselves serving. And so uh, would you consider uh, taking on the attitude of Christ and seeking out the interests of others this Christmas season. These cards are available in the back as you leave. Grab it. You can put it up on your fridge and it'd be just something fun to do as a family. Well, as we enter into our teaching time, would you open up with me to the book of Philippians, the New Testament book of Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And so during this Christmas season, we are looking at this passage from Philippians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul gives us, as we're calling our series, the example of Christ. The, the example that, that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, have the opportunity to follow, to reflect, as we are in relationship with each other within the body of Christ. And in this passage, we are given the example of the humility of Christ as displayed through his birth and through his humanity. In this passage, we're given the example of the obedience of Christ as displayed for us through his death. And then Paul tells us that the humanity of, or the humility of Christ and the obedience of Christ then leads to this word. The exaltation of Christ where Jesus is given the name that is above all other names so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, one of the reasons that I want us to spend time in this passage during this Christmas season is that not only does this passage cause us to reflect, one, on the birth of Christ through his humility, and not only does this passage cause us to reflect on the reason why he was born, the death of Christ is displayed through his obedience, but this is a passage that causes us to reflect on the attitude of Christ. The same attitude that should be our attitude toward one another within the body of Christ. You see, so, sometimes the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the, the, the death of Christ can, can be something that becomes detached from us. That, that we're grateful that Christ did these things for us. But sometimes the attitude of Christ doesn't impact our own attitude. The, the manner in which Christ lived doesn't impact the manner in which we live. We, we can come into a season like this and we can embrace all of the festivity of the season and the songs of the season and the messages of the season and we marvel that, that God became flesh and lived among us. We, we marvel the fact that he humbled himself to be born a baby in a stable full of animals in a tiny town of Bethlehem. We, we marvel at the attitude of humility and compassion and love and sometimes we never Never move beyond the marvel and let his attitude become our attitude. May we not just embrace the humility of the nativity, may we not just embrace the compassion and love of the nativity and refuse to take on the attitude on display of the nativity. That may the attitude of Christ become our attitude. Well, last week we looked at the humility of Christ. This week we're going to look at the obedience of Christ. And so would you read with me in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Jesus 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, obedience is not really a word that we typically think of as one of those great Christmas words. I mean, obedience is not typically a word that we print in a fun Christmas story font and put in a gold frame and make a part of our church Christmas decorations. I mean, if you can put words up here, we, we, we think of words like joy, hope, peace. Don't really think about obedience. I imagine not many of you put together your Christmas cards and had a picture of your family with the saying that says, A season to obey. You handed those out. Hallmark's not making a whole lot of Christmas specials centered around the warm, fuzzy emotion of obedience. And yet, obedience is one of the primary themes of the Christmas season. And one of the primary themes of the life of Christ. The, the attitude of obedience is at the very heart of why the Son of God became flesh and was born a baby in Bethlehem. Romans chapter 5, 18 through 19 a verse that Westbrook just read says this, Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. You see, the disobedience of Adam and Eve resulted in the fall of humanity leading to the sins, to sin's condemnation to be placed upon humanity. And that condemnation is this, death. Eternal separation from God in a very real place called hell. Through Adam, all are now born into sin. And because of that, we are all born falling short of the glory of God. But as Romans 5 just told us, deliverance from this death has been made possible through obedience. Obedience of Christ, the Son of God, who came into this world for the very purpose of saving his people from their sins. And so when we think about the Christmas story, the season, and we see the nativity, and when we, when we see that baby lying in a manger, when we need to think that one of the primary reasons that that baby is there is because it is an act of obedience. And so in Philippians chapter 2, when Paul has given us the example of Christ, and he said, this should be your attitude. This, is, this should be how you relate to each other within the body of Christ. He said, being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You know, last week we looked at verse 7, in which Paul said that Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. And now in verse 8, Paul makes another similar statement. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient. We, 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 have, we have two very similar themes here. A servant, one who serves someone else, and now one who is obedient to the will of someone else. And so if we know nothing else about what the attitude of Christ is, if we know nothing else about what his example is, we should at least know that this attitude that you and I should have is not, is an attitude that is not centered on ourselves. You see, this is what gets you and I often into trouble, is when we make our lives about ourselves. We make our lives about our will and our desires and our own wants. 
And many of us have sat in that place of discouragement because something in our life didn't go our way. Because something in our life didn't happen the way we wanted it to happen. And what happens when we sit in that place of discouragement and then we just take roots in that place of discouragement is then our attitude can turn to a place of bitterness. Our, our, our attitude can turn to a place of anger and resentment and it can begin to just destroy the very relationships that are all around us. And it can be easy to find ourselves in that place because that is our natural human desire to guard our own self-interests. See, our, our natural human bent is to preserve our own will, our own wants, our own desires. And there's so many things in this life that, that come into our life that go against our own wants. There's so many things that we face every day that go against the things that we desire. There's so many things in our life that can put us in a relational battle against one another. Because my will is different than your will. The Apostle Paul recognizes this. This is why he says, you have to have a different attitude toward each other. See, see you, you can't take on your natural attitude of self-preservation. You've got to put on the attitude of Christ, an attitude of humility, and an attitude of obedience. You know, the, the sort of obedience... It was one of the central themes of the life and the ministry of Christ. John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. I always find that to be a strange statement for the Son of God to say. The Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that's what the Son does. In other words, Jesus is telling those listening to him, my life is not based on my own desires. My, my life is not based on my own plans and wants and dreams, but my life is based on what I see the Father doing and what he does, I do. John chapter 6, verse 38, John said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. We don't often think of the Father giving a commandment to the Son of God, but the Father has given the Son a commandment. And in that commandment is what he is to say and what he is to speak. Jesus displayed humility in this life by living his life in obedience to the Father. In obedience, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, that even led to his death. You know, one of the most famous words of obedience was uttered by Jesus the night he was betrayed. And the night he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 tells us that, that Jesus went to this garden and he fell on his face and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. When he's referring to a cup, he's referring to the cup of suffering that, that he is about to experience on the cross. He says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And then we come to some of his most, his most famous words on obedience. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, it's one thing for Jesus to stand out there in front of the crowds and just say, I want you to know I don't do anything on my own. I just look to see where the Father is at work, and that's what I go and do. It's one thing to say that. It's an easy thing to say. In fact, some Christians, I think, use it as an excuse for simply to do whatever they want to do. Hey, I'm not living my own life here. I'm just trying to obey God here. And sometimes that statement can become a self-righteous statement of self-protection. But Jesus wasn't using that statement as an excuse not to take accountability for his own actions, but rather Paul tells us that Christ was so committed to obeying the will of the Father that it literally led to his death. And Paul makes a point to say his death on the cross. The point of, of, of saying death on the cross is to remind us of the horrific suffering that happens when one is crucified on a cross. Well, why the emphasis on obedience? 
Why why is that such a central theme in the life of Jesus? Why why is that an example for us? Why why would obedience be an example for us? Why why is it so important for us to see the Son of God obeying God the Father? I mean, if Jesus spoke, couldn't we just say that's God speaking? If Jesus is doing something, can't we just say those are the actions of God? Why couldn't Jesus own his own actions? He was God. Why was it so important that Jesus makes it clear that he lives and speaks according to the will of someone else? According to the will of the Father. Because Jesus is modeling in his humanity what it looks like for humanity to live in a manner that brings glory to God. You see, you and I were created to live in accordance to the will of the Father. That's how you and I were created to live. But sin distorted that in our lives. And now, the natural bent in our lives is is to preserve our own will, to to do our own desires, to to live according to our, our own interests. That is our natural bent. In fact, it feels unnatural to yield to the will of someone else. We kind of resist that, don't we? Someone says, I want you to do something. That word obedience just kind of rubs against us. It feels unnatural. And yet that is how we were created. To yield to the will of the Father. This is what Jesus came to model. A life that was reminding us Even the Son of God says, my life is not my own. His example is our example. He says that this is how you are to live. And this is what makes Philippians 2 so challenging. See, it's, it's one thing to marvel that Jesus lived according to the will of the Father, even to the point of death. It's another thing to say in humility, I'm going to do the same thing. In humility, I'm also going to live according to the will of the Father, even to the point of death. You know, this is not just the challenge of Philippians 2. This is what Jesus said. He says, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will live according to the will of the Father. And these words were repeated by his disciple John, who wrote in 1 John 2, 3, By this we can be sure that we have come to know him. Okay, this, this is how I know that I have come to know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. 2 John 1, 6, and, 6, and this is love. You ever wonder, what is love? I mean, what is love? that we walk according to his commandments. The the call of the Christian is not to live life according to our own will, but according to the will of the Father. The, The primary attitude that should shine in our lives is that we live letting people know that our life is not our own. The primary attitude that should shine in our lives is that we have an attitude that says, I'm not preserving my own will. I'm not preserving my own desires. I'm not preserving my own wants. The primary attitude that should shine in our lives is an attitude of obedience to God. Which means what? It means we need to obey God. I know that's a simple statement. But, but, but obedience begins by actually knowing the Word of God so I can walk in accordance to the Word of God. I think too many Christians today are simply responding to their own desires and they call it the will of God. And yet, if I'm going to truly love Christ and He says I do that by following His commands, I need to know what He commands. I need to know what He is calling me to. Now, you know what the real challenge with obedience is? Now, I, I, I do think the first challenge is knowing what we are to obey. But I think the real challenge with obedience is that it's a word that runs counter to our culture. 
In fact, I, I won't just simply blame on our culture, but it's a word that runs counter to our own natural sinful nature. Deferring my will to the will of someone else is not something that you and I easily do. In fact, it's something we often resist. I, I, I think this is why Scripture gives us many opportunities to exercise the example of Christ. Have you seen that? When it talks about what it looks like in, in Christian living, that we're often called to obedience. Ephesians 6.1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. From an early age, that we're, we're taught that the understanding that God has placed us under authority, and this is for our benefit and for our protection and for our maturity. And then we grow up and we find ourselves getting a job, and now we're, we're under the, the authority of an employer. Ephesians 5, 6, and six, uh, Ephesians 6, 5 through 6 says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. And, and then we enter into marriage relationships, and God once again calls us into obedience. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as... Christ gave us the example. So love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for us. Well, how did Christ love the church? Well, in obedience. He laid down his life for us. And so husbands, the, our starting point in loving our wives, our starting point in truly loving them is being men who are walking in obedience to the Father. An obedience that may call us to lay down our lives, our pride, our self-interest for the sake of our wives. Scripture just continues all throughout, all throughout Scripture, calling us to obey a civic authority, calling us to obey church authority for, for the sake of Christ. One of the great themes of our life as believers in Jesus Christ is this theme of obedience. Because of the call of Christ or the call of Christians is to recognize that we weren't created for our own will. We were created to reflect the one who created us. We were created to yield our will to the will of the Father. You know, when I'm meeting with someone who is struggling with some issue in their life, and, and, and they're, they're, they're wrestling with some conflict in their life. There's some struggle in their life. Well, one of my first questions, if they're a believer in Jesus Christ, is I'll ask this. What do you believe is your place of obedience before God in this situation? So you're thinking through this issue in your life. You go, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to walk through this. What is your place of obedience before God? It's funny how, how rarely we start there, and yet that should always be our starting point. God, how is it that you want me to walk in obedience to you? You know, too often times we enter into seasons of struggle. And we enter those seasons of struggle by asking all the personal questions. God, how is this impacting me? And, and how are my needs being impacted in this season? And, and God, what, 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 do you, what do you want for me during this season? And what's best for my family during this season? And what's best for our church family during this season? We, we automatically go into these self-reflection questions. And on the surface, they can seem like good questions to be asking. And there may be a place for us to ask those questions in the process. But as believers, in Jesus Christ, the foundational question is always, what is my place of obedience before you, God? What is it that you are desiring of me? Not my will, but yours. And the challenge with obedience, and the challenge that Jesus faced as his obedience was causing him to stare death on a cross in the face is that many times obedience leads to suffering. In the moment that our act of obedience leads to pain, we have a tendency to say, I'm out. Clearly God was never wanting me to suffer. Clearly my obedience to you should never cause pain in my life. It should never, never cause pain in my family's life. And yet the moment that we bolt when it gets hard, we lose the opportunity to learn the example of Christ. 
we, 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 we lose the opportunity to learn obedience. Listen to Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. In the days of his flesh, this is referring to the day that the Jesus was on this earth, walking in his human body, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. This is that, that picture in the garden in which he says, Remove this cup from me, Father, if you will. It says Jesus was heard because of his reverence. And although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Isn't that an interesting statement about Jesus? He learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Christ learned obedience through the suffering of obedience. When you and I learn to obey, it is often in times in which it is hard to obey, sometimes even painful to obey. Because what the obedience does is it, it begins to strip away the stuff we're holding on to. It begins to strip away our pride. It begins to strip away our self-preservation. It begins to strip away our self-will. And that stuff hurts. There will be times in which we say, but God, I don't want to love that person because they are unkind to me and they say hurtful things to me. Why would I be loving to them? There will be times when we say, well, I don't want to obey my parents. They don't get it. They don't understand what I'm going through. There will be times when we'll say, I don't want to love my wife. She doesn't treat me the way I want to be treated. Walking in obedience often requires the laying down of our pride, which is one of the purposes of obedience. So that the attitude of Christ shines and not my own attitude. Obedience leads us to living out the words of Jesus who said, if any would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. You know what's interesting about that statement? It is, it is living out the example of Christ. Look what he is asking. We deny ourselves and take up our cross. You see, you and I are also called to humble ourselves even to the point of death. Death on the cross. When we think of Jesus and what he has called us to, you know what the amazing thing is that he did not stand up on high and say, you need to humble yourself even to the point of taking up your cross. He didn't make that command from above high. He made it as one who was a human, a servant, who in obedience to the Father took up his cross and in humility offered his life on a cross. And in his example, he says, you go and do the same because your life is not your own but we have the privilege of living according to the will of the Father. And so what is your place of obedience right now? You may have something in your life and you, you're working through something, wrestling through something, struggling through something. What is your place of obedience before the Father? And maybe there's not necessarily something in your life. So what is it that God is calling you to do? on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning, in which you wake up that day and you live according to the will of the Father. What is our place of obedience? I'm so grateful that we, we, we don't speak these words in asking ourselves to live this way in a manner in which God never did. But in humility, Jesus was obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross. And then he says, come, follow me. Take up your cross in obedience. May we yield our lives to the Father. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come on up and as they come up, would you, would you join me in prayer to the Father? Oh, Father, obedience is a hard word. That in our natural nature, we, we kick against it, we wrestle against it, we, 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 we just, it, it, it sits on us in a way that we don't like it. And yet it is your desire for us, you create us to yield our lives to you.
I'm so grateful that your son came and he modeled something that we get to model. That in humility he walked in obedience to you. And and this wasn't just words that he spoke, but he gave his life of obedience to you for our sake. Father, I pray that we, we in humility could come before you and say, God, may we live our lives in accordance to your will. May, may we walk in accordance to your heart and your desires. And may our attitude shine that we are people yielding to someone else. That we are people yielding to the very creator of this world who loves us and who loves everyone and is inviting us into a relationship with him. God, as we, we come and we celebrate this season of the birth of your son, maybe remember the example of humility. And maybe we remember this example of obedience. And may it be our attitude. And we may we live in a life that reflects him. God, thank you. God, thank you. And we ask this in the name of the one who modeled these things. In the name of Jesus. Amen.